What is happening, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 13, the official Voyager 3 podcast. And we're here tonight with Aaron, Greg, and my name is Steve. And we're going to start off with the mailbag right off the top. Mailbag. Because we have a sweet, sweet physical box that we got from way on the west side of the country. This is not a comment. This is not an email. This is something tangible. Although there's nothing wrong with those things. Those things are great. Comments That's right. and emails are great. That's right. So keep See them coming. <laughs> but uh, it came with a note. So I'm going to read the note real quick. It says, uh, hey, guys, just wanted to share some local beer with you to enjoy on the podcast. I tried to see if there was any local microbrewing place doing ginger beer, but found nothing you can't get anywhere else. Keep making some kick-ass music, and hopefully we'll run into you at a convention in the near future. Thanks. The Found on Shelf podcast, Dustin and Patrick. Guys, man, Come thank on. you so much. So here's what we got. Are you ready? We got two different kind of beers. The first one we got is from Level Beer. It's called Game On, and I know... You guys love that can. It is so cool. It's Super Mario Brothers all day long. And uh, let me look at that. Let me look at that. It's an Indian pale ale. Well, hey, Greg, I'll tell you what, man. Why don't you just take one? Are you ready? Here you go, man. Enjoy. All right. And then the this. other one we got. Game on. That's right. Is by. Hold on. Let's get the sound of me cracking. Yeah, there you, you go. Crack that into the mic. Oh, man. <laughs> That's the you sound that? of success. I felt like you cracked Cheers. open two. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like. Yeah. All right, I hopefully, milked it. Hopefully, it's ice cold. Now oh, the yeah. other one, it's real cold, but it's from uh, Elysian Brewing, and it's called Altered Contact. What do you think about that? Look at that can, Aaron. Like this uh, kind of like spoofing um, Altered Alt State film. You should Let give that see. one to Aaron. That. Aaron, one. Oh, you want one of these? Hand man? that to Aaron yeah. through okay. the screen. Here, here you go, man. Cool. Oh yeah. Enjoy, man. Enjoy. It's great. Um, Let's so see again, thanks super, super amount to, uh, to, uh, found on the shelf podcast, Dustin and Patrick, man. Yeah. That you was guys solid. Rock. Super cool. Really appreciate it. You, you know, if nothing these. else, if nothing else, our podcast was good for some free beer. <laughs> there you go. Right. Right. And so I I'm myself, a success. I yes. myself, I'm, I'm bringing something new to the mix a little bit. Uh, this yeah, I just picked up got. today. Uh, it might look familiar, but I guarantee you it's not. This is not oh, white. It's, it's called a beige monster. Ultra peachy keen. So it's like a peach colored. Is it peach? And I've never had this. I'm going to try it right now. It could be awesome. Or I could be like, oh my God, what in the hell did I get? You never know. You have to you know? drink the whole thing too. There's That's like right. No matter what. Ounces in there. Another, another crack. Aaron, did you crack yours open? Yeah, I did. All right, let's do a toast to Found on Shelf podcast. Cheers, guys. Thank you, guys. Ooh, this is good. Touch the screen. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually really good, too. The super tart, um, citrusy IPA. And um, there you go. It seems like IPA that. seems to be the theme that you guys like well, pretty much the most. That's all we talk about. <laughs> right, right. So Aaron it's a, sure bet. a good Modelo, man. <laughs> it's really it's nice and sour and citrusy for sure how is that one greg uh this is a pretty uh pretty good standard ipa not too different from too hearted or any of the stuff that we can get around here so really really solid awesome. i like it that is how's that cool. the brew hall. how's that uh, believe peach? it or not this peach is awesome i would totally get it again so it was a blind purchase and it's good cheers no. there you go <laughs> All right, so our first um, topic tonight, Obi-Wan Kenobi series on Disney Plus that just finished up, I think last night was when the uh, sixth and final episode of the series aired. And, uh, you know, I got, uh, got kind of mixed emotions with it uh, personally. Overall, I did like it. I would say if I had to make any complaints about it, I would say there's there's maybe two major things but before i talk about the complaints i want to talk about the stuff that i liked right because I, I, I want to be more positive instead of just ragging on something because there was a lot of cool things um first of all i think you guys would agree 
Ewan McGregor, um, he's Obi Wan. You know what I mean? Like from the prequels, he's perfect mannerisms, all of his acting. That was awesome. And yeah. uh, the actress uh, Moses Ingram, who played uh, Inquisitor Riva, the, the third sister, I loved it. That was a cool concept. I, I, I since learned that uh, there's the Inquisitors that have happened like either in the cartoons or the comics or the books, or, you know, other ancillary things besides the films. I love that concept where they're kind of hunting the remaining Jedi. Um, cool concept. Uh, all the Inquisitors looked really cool to me. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this real quick. Did you guys ever get a little bit of vibe of uh, a little bit of the bad guys from Dark City? I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had that look to them. Was, um, especially the, uh, the the Grand Inquisitor. He looked like a corpse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, so did the other dude with the helmet hat thing. He looked pretty much pretty kind of rotten, too. So Yeah, yeah right, right. It had that Dark City uh, vibe, for sure. Doesn't yeah. that doesn't that go along with being a Sith, though? Like, the longer you're a Sith, the more pale or, like, dead you look? It I does seem that I way, like, Palpatine that was a, I, I has been that was eaten up a thing. by the dark side, right. right? Yeah, that's what I kind of um, think, too, sometimes. I mean, Darth Maul didn't, but he maybe didn't live long enough to, to grow right. like that. But, yeah, I, uh, you know, maybe that's something in my head, but I feel like I heard that somewhere that, you know, that's why they always start to, you know, the longer that you're a part of the dark side, the the worse you look. Right. I don't know. Somebody, somebody in the comments tell us if we're crazy. Well, right. I mean, that's Did definitely I, what happened. That's what happened to Palpatine. I don't know if that's across the board with all the Sith, but I, if it happened to him, maybe it happened to them too. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, a couple of other elements that really stood out to me as being cool is uh, I loved Haja Estri, who was played by the um, the comic Kumail Nanjanani. He, hilarious. I, I love that that kind of comic relief, and he's got a great energy about him. And the fact that he was kind of like the the fake Jedi running the scam type of thing, you know, I, I thought that was really cool. And then lastly, really dug uh, the character of Tala because. If you, as you can imagine, with the Empire doing what they were doing, there's going to be people who are like, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. So it's realistic to me. You know, I'm, I'm sure that in future Star Wars stories, there's probably going to be more people who are revealed to be kind of like, you know, uh, fifth column. What were some positives that you guys took from it, uh, if any? Because <laughs> I know it's got mixed, mixed reviews across the board. I know this. Yeah. Now, we do need to be careful because didn't the last episode just come out yesterday or That's correct. the day before? Yeah, like yeah, one so day we ago. Should be, we should be a little careful, I suppose. I mean, I, you know, we always are going to spoil something because we can't keep track. But uh, Right. Well, in, I guess we'll just say in this segment of Obi-Wan Kenobi, there might be light spoilers uh, about each episode. Not high detail, but just kind of sort of what happens maybe. So be mindful. I think um, it was, it looked great. You know, that's one of the, one of my positives about it. It looked, you know, it looked like star Wars and all, all these new star Wars series are doing on Disney plus have that a hundred percent cinematic look to them, big budget and everything. And this is just a, it's just a five hour long movie. Basically not every episode is exactly an hour. So it's like a five and a half hour long movie. Um, right. I, I, I thought um, overall it was, it was cool. It had some great um, sort of emotional moments. I thought really this last episode t did a great job of tying everything together. Um, you know, and, and just um, giving it, giving Obi-Wan a, a nice adventure, sort of some of the things that we would have hoped for in, in the, in the prequel trilogy that we didn't get a lot of, you know, um, we, 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 I mean, people of our generation had this idea of what the prequels were going to be like, and they kind of, we didn't really get that. We didn't get the Clone Wars. I, I think episode three was the best of the prequels, but I, I overall, I'm not a huge fan of the prequels. And so this was kind of a, almost a makeup for that in a way, um, yeah. giving him some more stuff to do, some more cool things. And um, yeah, so overall, I did like it. I mean, even when there are flaws and there are um, whatever continuity things that come up and I might complain about it, I'm still going to watch it. Like every time, even when I think they're oversaturating and they're putting too many series or too many movies out, 
I'm still going to be there on the first night watching them. So I um, have I, I, my objectivity is questionable, but um, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was I thought it was overall cool. And then when we get into the negative stuff, I can go into that. But what about you, Greg? Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned uh, our generation because you know I think about those guys that we uh, we sat with and discussed um, the book of Boba Fett. Oh yeah, Galaxy and, of Film podcast. Yeah, yeah, Galaxy of Film guys. I know that they're super hyped on this Obi Wan thing because you know that's their Obi Wan and that's you know you know um, Hayden. What's his name? Hayden Christensen. Yeah, I got that right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's their Darth Vader. You know what I mean? So like, I'm glad you mentioned the generational thing because we we mentioned this at practice the other night. You know, they're not making they're not making these new series for guys like us. You know what I mean? Like, I think they are to an extent, but like, I feel like they're moving on with Star Wars and guys like us who are, you know, sort of tied to that original trilogy and you know, that's all we want to see. I think we all need to get comfortable with the fact that they're going to do whatever they want. And, yeah. you know, it, we're not going to be, we're not going to be super happy with it, but you know, I'll sort of, I'll start with the positive too. I, I thought that the one major fight was really good and, you know, it ought, like Aaron said, it always looks cinematic. Um, I think, it looks like star Wars. This series felt like star Wars, even though, you know, like same as you guys, you know, I have some criticisms of some choices they made, but overall, I think it looks like star Wars. It feels like star Wars, you know, and they did a good job with the one fight, you know, that I won't say too much about, but um, that's sort of the positives for me. Like Aaron, you know, I, I find it hard to be critical of, you know, content, content that's essentially free. So, you know, I'm going to be there. If it's Star Wars, I'm going to be there watching it. And, you know, it's better to have Obi-Wan than not have it, you know? Yeah. So that's about the nicest way I can say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, sure. I want to pipe in with that, too. I thought all the fights were great. Um, the, the big finale fight, the one they had in the in the sort of I don't know, episode three or something in the middle of the show. Right. Um, the fights with Reva were great. All, all that stuff. Yeah, all the uh, all the duels have been really cool and kind of um, they found ways to make each one different, you know, each. Right. Yeah. Each one kind of stood on its own um, instead of just being all oh, they're They're fighting again. It's the same right. thing. They're all different. So, OK, but yeah, nothing, nothing on the level of they live, though, because that, <laughs> that fight will, will never match. that fight will never be topped <laughs> never, by any movie. That's right. That's right. I guess so. Um, one of the complaints that I have about it, and this also happened in the book of Boba Fett a bit, is that kind of like the pacing was herky jerky. I felt like it began maybe a little slower than it needed to, and then it tried to catch itself up real quickly in a couple, in, in like one episode, and, and, and a lot of things happened that kind of didn't have a, like a balance or like a a natural flow to it. Um, I guess uh, this would be a a, a, little, a bit of a spoiler here. Uh, so if anybody's listening who has not seen it yet, this is your uh, warning. The next couple things I say will be spoiler-ish. Um, uh, as we know, in episode five, I think, it was either four or five, it, it turns out what Reva's real plan is, right? Um, I just thought that that was too quick. You know, it didn't make sense to have revealed so harshly, so abruptly to me. That kind of jarred me in the story. I mean, the, the fact that that was her plan is no problem, but it could have just been done a little smoother, a little bit of a more of a gentle gradient or, or however you want to say something like that. So the other thing, um, that, uh, that bugged me, uh, also spoiler ish right now is I don't think that she should have lived. Um, in, in, in my opinion, um, because now you have a loose end out there, that still might be questionable. You don't know if she's a hundred percent what she appears to be at the end. Right. So I don't know, man, you know, it's, it's such a high stake. Like that's everything, every, every, everything. I, I feel like, nope, but Hey, it, it's you know. funny that it's funny that the, that the fact that she lived bothers you and not the other character who could have easily been dispatched, Yeah, you know, and, but you can't, 
<laughs> no, yeah, I know. For you know sure. what I mean? Like, I don't. So that that was one of my top criticisms was, you know, that whole thing should have just ended right there when he had the chance, you know. But, right, right. But then, um, yeah, then there's no movies. <laughs> right. But uh, okay. Then, then, so my last criticism. This is also a spoiler. So please uh, skip or mute or whatever if uh, if you are in the dark and and continue to want to be until you watch it yourself. So. In my opinion, um, I liked everything about the choice of the story and where everything went and pulling him, pulling Obi-Wan away for a mission like this. He didn't want to leave Tatooine. We know this because he wants to keep an eye on Luke and be also below, below radar, obvious for obvious reasons, right? The Jedi are all but extinct. He wants to remain living, so he doesn't want to draw any attention to himself. All that part of the story was great. So what super powerful thing can they possibly think of to get him uh, off the planet and have an adventure. Okay, I'll buy into that. Um, but the Darth Vader thing, uh-uh. I, I don't think he should have even been in the in the series at all. Um, because now, doesn't to to me, doesn't it to you all listening? Doesn't it diminish the absolute hell out of the duel in Episode Four on the Death Star? Like that was supposed to be the first time they meet since Revenge of the Sith. That's how I took it. That's how I believe it should be. Uh, that's mm-hmm. how everything else pointed it to be that way. So when they meet right there, holy shit, is that a big deal? And there's all this emotion and fear on both sides, probably, and all this stuff, um, uh, anger, revenge, resentment, fill in the blank, you know, tons of stuff, heavyweight, important, holy shit moment. Well, now, eh, we already been there. We already done that a little bit. <laughs> it's just... God dang it. Why did they do that? I mean, they could have had another bad guy or not have them cross paths at all. And maybe at the very end, maybe Vader sensed Obi-Wan's presence somewhere in the galaxy for a second, like they did at the very end of episode one or beginning of two, right? You know, his eyes opened while he was in the back of the tank, right? Just like that. And then it ends, you know, something like that. Just to hint, but not give you all of that. To me, that that that's more of the current Star Wars kind of pooping on the original stuff and like we don't care we're just gonna do we're just gonna do this and there you go but but there's a big asterisk and and my wife was laughing at me today when i was telling her about this another spoiler please don't listen if you haven't seen this yet the duels were fucking awesome i loved the hell out of them especially the final one but both pretty cool but that last one oh my god it's everything i've ever wanted to see but it should have been some other movie, some other way, some other thing. I don't know. Or that well, should have been, it, I don't even know, you know, the episode it, four it, special, special edition or something lost scene. A, <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> it's exactly what we were, what I was talking about earlier. They're really trying to be everything for every fan. You know what I mean? So that's yeah. why Darth Vader is in this. Right. Because they, can't, they, they can't help it. Right. Like yeah, you said. they can't, they can't yeah. help, but throw, the old school folks a bone, you know, and right. they're just, no. they're just, they're just kind of wedging it in. There's no pop value without Darth Vader, right? There's nothing mm-hmm. talking more than Darth Vader. Just like when he was in rogue one and he had that three minutes or whatever. Oh yeah. It's fucking amazing. Movie. Yeah. That's all anybody talked about when the movie was over. He didn't need to be in the movie, right? But it, it, it changes everything when you bring him in. So yeah, like Greg's saying, it's like they want to be everything to everybody. Yeah, and, uh, and I even believe that Darth Vader scene in Rogue One was last minute. I think they put that in way after the fact. I think I read that. They're like, hey, we need a little something at the end. And they're like, hey, wait, how about this? Yeah, yeah how about that? that that's overall. That's overall my problem or whatever my hurdle to get over with this series is continuity in general is is right. You know, we we have this we have a story presented to us back in 1977 that um, the Jedi are all but extinct. They've been hiding out whatever few of them are out there They're there. You don't see them anymore. And Obi-Wan's just this old. Oh, oh, Ben, that old hermit out in the Dune Sea, just some dude, you know, yeah. some old guy, some crazy and old man. Yeah. You get obviously the impression that Luke has never met him. He's heard about him. And um He's kept his distance, right? And then everything, Luke is now of age and the whole story starts up. Uh, or, you know, if you're going by 
prequel continuity, the story begins again, right? But for us, that was the start of it. And um, Obi-Wan's been out there biding his time, waiting, waiting for, for Luke to be able to train him. Yoda's been out there hiding out. And uh, the, he hasn't crossed paths with Vader for, you know, 20 years. So then this, the, not only does this show bring them together more than once throughout this throughout the series but it also says well obi-wan wasn't exactly hiding you know he he hid for a while and then he came out and had a grand adventure and everyone <laughs> yeah. knew he was out there. yeah it's not like he was wearing a mask or he was using a false name the, all the the whole dark side was coming after obi-wan particularly yeah. and so he was he completely blew his cover and um, and I know he had a good reason to do it. Uh, he had a good reason to go out there. But as far as um, revealing himself and you know when making himself like just a walking billboard for for the Jedi, right. um, you know that's the thing. So so there is the, uh, yeah. Now he's got to go back to hiding on Tatooine. So he's not even going to stash away on another planet. <laughs> it all just right. kind of comes back <laughs> and. Um, and it's a lot to swallow continuity wise, you know, him doing all this stuff, meeting Vader again. How do you sandwich in these these conflicts with Va uh, confrontations with Vader um, in between Revenge and and uh, New Hope? Well, we just got to got to make it work and we got to give everybody what they want. And then we'll just have to believe that this is the way it goes. Now, here's my asterisk. They did a great job in the final episode of smoothing some of that stuff over of making it um a little a little more plausible of why he could go and 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 hide out again and steve that's one thing that um they did too i don't want to give everything away but the conversation that uh the emperor had with vader about you know at the end mm -hmm. about his feelings yeah and and kind of telling him hey pull it in man you can't be so obsessed you got to be able to um operate you know handle the normal day-to-day -day business <laughs> yeah a whole galaxy to worry about you can't be obsessing about this so that kind of brings that passion down for when when uh they meet again you know there's not as much of a need for revenge or, or all those things um it's more like it's you know Vader doesn't seem all in, in the original movie he doesn't seem all that perturbed about obi-wan in my opinion it's like yeah. you know he says you should not have come here you know and your powers are weak old man and and he's kind of toying with him in that fight because obi-wan can't do much and um he kind of feels i think satisfied like this is too easy and but i'm going to end it finally and but he doesn't seem full, filled with rage to me and this kind of bridges that yeah uh, that's a good way. point i hadn't thought of it like that See, Aaron, Aaron's always good to like help you out with that. The Star Wars digest a little bit. He's good with that. So yeah, that's that's my thing. Is all the continuity and all the kind of things that we're supposed to believe from this show. But what about you, Greg? Oh, you on my criticisms? So mm -hmm. I'm gonna. I'll, well, I I mentioned one of the major ones earlier, but uh, I'll just say this: are, 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 is everybody just about done with Tatooine? I mean, if I was hiding out, I would not be on Tatooine. You yeah. got the Mandalorian running around there, Boba yeah, Fett's it's there. Yeah, like, it's like the Obi central Wan's hub there. Yeah. of Star I mean, Wars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I was if I was looking for somebody and I was the Empire, I'd just set your course for Tatooine. Let's go. They're probably out there. Right. Right. Every, everybody's and, there. All the best film crews are there. And all I mean, the guys it's a giant universe and everything is going on on Tatooine. Every I'm just, I'm kind of getting burnt out on it, you know? So, again, I... I try to be positive about this stuff. I'm glad that we get to watch it, but I mean, that's my biggest criticism. I'm kind of burnt out on tat Tatooine. I, I just want to see a different planet once in a while. We got a little bit of it in this, this series, Yeah. you know, they went, you know, to the prequel, you know, settings and that was kind of a, a refreshing change for, for a minute, but then, you know, right back to Tatooine. Right. So yep. that's my biggest criticism. Yeah. And uh, you know, and, I, and I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to choose something that's different than what you guys have already said. So yeah, right. and and definitely too. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when I would when I say that uh, it's definitely worth watching. I mean, if you like Star yeah. Wars, watch them. You know, absolutely. Binge it this you're weekend, like it. or or as soon as you can, and uh, you're going to enjoy it. There's lots of good stuff. Um, 
great action, uh, great texture, and and that Star Wars vibe that you get. You know, I, I believe the main theme was composed by John Williams, but then all the rest of the score was done by a different composer. All right. Well, I got one more. I got one more criticism. Okay, okay. go ahead, Greg. And this is this is definitely a spoiler. So if we haven't warned you enough up until this point, you know, um, how come everybody can get stabbed with a lightsaber and just walk away from it nowadays? <laughs> it, it depends on what they need for the story. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, well, that's, the story okay, so they're gonna die. They're so, gonna die. If they need them to yeah. live, it's arbitrary. Yeah. I mean, is it cauterizing the wound? You know, oh, yeah. I, maybe, maybe that's part of it. You know, yeah, it's just, it just cauterizing a giant hole and then they're fine. Just right. walk right away. Right. It's almost as if nothing happened. Work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, she was in pain. She was in pain, but she's living. Oh, was she? Yeah. Well, yeah. when I stub my toe, I'm in pain. <laughs> right. Right. And that's not like getting a lightsaber, you know, thrust, yeah. thrust through your gullet. Right. Oh, yeah. Qui-Gon Jinn is like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and and so is uh, so is Han Solo. Okay, well, in in celebration of this being V three cast episode thirteen, I thought that it would be fun for us to talk about what is our favorite Friday the Thirteenth episode. There's a lot of them, you know. And I'm ready for over this. the years. I'm ready for this. Gre- question yeah, greg is ready for this for sure i can tell by his shirt <laughs> that's but, not a hint at my favorite episode though right on go ahead greg you can go first because i think out of all of us i think you like friday the 13th above everybody else i believe which is which is awesome it's a great series i love them all i'll just say that i even love jason takes manhattan i knew you were which, gonna say that <laughs> which which divides people right <laughs> but uh i like them all i even like uh i even like the <laughs> jason x you know oh so, yeah in space the yeah that's board. great yeah. that's great there's nothing not to love yeah. anyways um my absolute favorite though friday the 13th part two is the best one nice that was my prediction for you i believe i believe i i i believed you were gonna and, say that and, and i'll tell you why because I was of the age when that movie was out and, um, you know, I talked, I think I talked in another podcast about how you could unscramble the cable box and like sort of watch a movie, Yeah, you know, kind of like a shitty scrambled version of it. But, uh, so when I was younger, I was in scouting and we used to go camping all the time and at the places that we went camping looked just like Friday the 13th part two. There's nice. these crappy rundown cabins. And you're in the middle of nowhere in the woods at night, you know? So these movies like resonated with me and especially that one, because, you know, that's the first one where it's kind of like a guy in the woods. The first one had the, the first one had the twist ending and it's probably, you know, people will argue that's the better one, you know, story-wise, but the second one was just brutal and it had the creepy guy in the woods that was trying to kill you. So for those reasons alone, Friday the 13th part two plus at that point, Jason wasn't totally, you know, he wasn't totally like, like super, uh, superhuman. Exactly. Like you, she, I think she kicks him in the balls at one point and he goes down. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I like the idea that he's kind of like an adolescent Jason and, you know, you still got a chance to kind of like out, outsmart him and, and, you know, he's still learning how to be, you know, the, the ultimate killer but i don't know there's just something charming about part two yeah and i like i like the music in that one the best and i don't know that's just that's the one for me dig it man dig it very cool how about you aaron well i have to agree part two um i i think about part one and i think part one is maybe the creepiest because you just don't know what's happening if, you, if you've never seen any of them before if you're coming into it clean you, you don't know what's happening. You don't know where the movie's going, right? By the yeah. time you get to the sequels, you get an idea. But, but it's, it's, you know, it's the mom and it's not Jason, right? So that takes away from it. Part two is the debut, well, not the debut, but the, the beginning of Jason's spree. And um, it, <clears throat> you know, even though he has the, the, the burlap sack or whatever, 
it's which is great by the way it's still (laughs) creepy and he's got that little that little hovel in the woods you know it's it's that's that's really creepy and then that leads to the the best ending maybe ever like as far as horror movies or or as far as Friday the 13th with the um with the shrine with the mother's head and the woman um getting the idea to kind of get into you know psych him out and and um listen to your mother all that stuff was great yeah. especially when you're a kid you're like man what's going on here like it was hard <laughs> to even understand because i was like eight years old or something yeah. um and it's also super creepy um you know it, some of the some of them aren't scary and that one still is uh so yeah i think i would have to say part two by the way though i do have to say that fresh freddie uh jason versus freddie we said it back when it came out our group us and john and whoever all of our our people back then we were like you know what that's it's the greatest story ever told and <laughs> it is. I, we still believe it like you know it's it's as far as to to get those two head to head you know it didn't even matter <laughs> doesn't matter it's just to have them in the in the in the movie together so that is still that's still the greatest story ever told but that's a completely different vibe but uh yeah what about you steve um you know i i i spent some time thinking about that and i agree with you guys completely um but uh since i thought at least greg would have uh chosen two i wasn't sure if you would chose chosen two as well aaron so i went ahead and chose three Ooh. Because it's not Three is that, solid, man. yeah, it's not that far removed from two as far as like it's still developing, and uh, Jason isn't exactly superhuman yet either. You know, he gets an axe to the head uh, and a, and a few other things uh, that that happened to him um, in that film, and he goes down and he's hung, you know, but with the noose and stuff. So he's not like you know in in later movies where he's like just a demon, I guess, or whatever. Um, and it's in 3D. I mean, come on, man. I'm kind of a kind of a sucker. I mean, everybody everybody knows that all the all the uh, most of the Voyager three albums have a 3D element uh, inside the vinyl. Um, Are you synthetic and War Mask both have uh, 3D flats that come with glasses, and you can check out um, the cool artwork. Um, so I went with that, and uh, you get the mask in that movie, so that's cool. So that's you know the iconic look of him that happens in that film. Um, and, uh, there's that sweet crossbow kill, you know, totally utilizing the 3d, the eye pop kill when he's crushing the guy's head. Right. And that hot poker stab in the, in the cabin, all of which is like, you know, coming right at you. <laughs> so, uh, that's very fun, you know, and I, I didn't see it in the theater, but I, I saw it on VHS, probably the, maybe the, the year after it came out, I think something like that, or maybe the, you know few months after but uh i didn't get the chance to see it in the theater unfortunately i was too young but uh um it was the second highest grossing horror film that year as well next to poltergeist which is understandable Man. poltergeist was killer uh-huh. <laughs> don't even get me started on that one that's a, that's a whole podcast right there for sure i think three had like some cool story elements too like i really related to the the nerdy kid trying to talk to the the one girl and she just won't even acknowledge him you know like i sort of felt for him and you know like he he runs over the bikers you know bikes and he's feeling all good about himself and it right doesn't on. amount to anything <laughs> you know he's trying to, he's trying to do all the right things and you just can't you know put it together because you know, we all felt that way a little bit when we were young, I'm sure. And right, right. I don't know. Three's got a lot of cool stuff going for it. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't feel like they, uh, you know, I, I think when they, when they introduced the hockey mask, I don't think they knew how iconic it would become, you know, like, I think it was just something that was on set that, right. You know, made sense at the moment. And, right. You know, and I it think it became this thing. Yeah, yeah, and I do believe three was supposed to be it. That was supposed to be the last film, but it's hard to say no to that money. <laughs> so right. when that did so well, they're like, "Well, can you think of a fourth one, maybe?" And they did, and then they kept the mask. Yeah, how about we? How about we think of way more than four? Yeah, exactly. Right. Let's get into some Voyager three news. We have kind of a lot of news today, so we're gonna start by saying we have a new piece of merch that I really think you guys are going to like. 
for those of you who have been with us for a long time, uh, some people really dig the album Doom Fortress. So what we have for sale right now in the Voyager 3 store is a Doom Fortress metallic gold coffee mug. I don't really think it gets better than that. No, I need that. that. For those of you who have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's exactly what he takes off of the thing at the beginning where he that's has right. the, the, you know, the, the sack of sand. He swaps in a Voyager 3 mug with a bag that's of right. sand and yep. all hell breaks loose. Yeah, nice. so it's a ceramic mug with a full color wrap around imprint that goes around the whole thing. It's kind of like the front sure. and back of the album that kind of wraps around and it's on sale right now in the Voyager 3 store, V-O-Y-A-G-3-R store.com. And uh, we also have something exciting, a you ticket know we love giveaway, coffee. ticket giveaways. Are you guys ready for this? Yes. Motor City Nightmares has been kind enough to give us two weekend passes. Nice. For Motor City Nightmare, which Should happens... Have been three. <laughs> yeah, for Voyager 3, right? Um, it happens uh, July 29 through 31st at the Sheraton Novi Detroit Hotel. And uh, Tell them who's going to be, there, be there. Oh, man, are you ready for who's going to be there? Because I'm going to be have, bringing all my stuff to have signed. Um, virtually all the cast from Dawn of the Dead. We got Ken Foray, Galen Ross, Scott Reiniger, and Tom Savini. Um, they also have photo ops for all those folks. So, you know, plan accordingly. You can get your photo taken with all those stars from the original 1978 Dawn of the Dead. Um, and we are going to be there on Friday and Saturday all day signing merch, selling merch, and Friday night's after party, the 29th July. We're playing live at the event. So you don't want to miss this. So get your tickets. Um, or you can win tickets, as we just said. So you might be asking yourself, how do I win tickets? Well, yeah, Steve, how I, devised, do we win I devised a trivia question that uh, oh. revolves around New York Ninja because mm. we've also done the score to New York Ninja, as many of you know. So whoever can answer this question, you have to email your answer to askv3cast at gmail.com. You have to put your name well first you have to put the answer then you have to put your full name <laughs> your email address and your phone number and if you win we'll, we'll reply to that email address with the information that you uh, need to get your tickets at will call at motor city nightmare so the question is are you ready which movie theater premiered new york ninja in michigan if you can answer that question Ooh, you, in get, michigan. you have a chance to win tickets it's a twist. Motor City Nightmares. And uh, another piece of news that we have is another live show. Are you ready? This one is e even before Motor City Nightmares. This is going to be on uh, Saturday, July 2nd at the Avenue in Lansing, Michigan. We're playing a, a show with... It's uh, like a week. That's right. It's coming right up, actually. We're, we're playing uh, with... Uh, uh, Centenary and Anvil Crawler. And from what I understand, they're both like absolute shredding uh, metal bands. So it's going to be a very fun night, very loud, very high energy. Um, so that's uh, the first Voyager 3 show back in quite a while. The last time we played was uh, Fright Fest with Twisted back last Devil's Night in uh, 2021. So if you're anywhere in Michigan and want to do a little road trip, come on out to the Avenue in Lansing on Saturday, July 2nd. Okay, our other main segment that we're going to get into tonight is super cool. Um, one of my favorite filmmakers making movies today, Panos Cosmatos, um, has maintained a pretty low profile lately um, since uh, making Mandy in 2018, which starred Nicolas Cage. Um, they just uh, announced that his next film has been revealed. Uh, he's reuniting with XYZ Films. Um, the film is called Necrocosm, and it's described as a science fiction fantasy. Uh, it's written by Panos Cosmatos and Megan Wong. Um, she's writing the script from a story they both came up with, and Panos is directing it. Um, and basically, all the other details of the film are being kept secret, which doesn't surprise me at all. Um, if you 
you know, Panos Cosmatos makes, you know, off the wall films that are uh, psychedelic, bombastic, chaotic. And I think he likes to have it hit you, you know, without having any kind of preconceived notions or any kind of things given away. Right. Um, so did you uh, say sci-fi fantasy, Steve? Yep. I sure did. And, uh, well, that seems like his wheelhouse now. Oh yeah. 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 And all the other details are being kept secret. It's being described as a phantasmical fantasy nightmare and set deep within a strange galaxy where two lovers are torn apart as they attempt to survive a brutal invasion. I'm sold. I'm, I'm Perfect. good. <laughs> That's all I need to know. I know, man. So uh, the company uh, A24 is going to produce it along with uh, the XYZ films, and A24, I guess, is going to do the financing and the worldwide release of it. Um, but I will say this, too. He's been busy. Panos has. Because there's also going to be a short uh, that he's doing. It's, he's doing one episode of uh, Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. It's kind of like an anthology. And uh, his episode that he did, I believe, is now in post-production. So it's actually going to be two things in the not-too-distant future from Panos Cosmatos, who is an outstanding filmmaker, for sure. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm ready to devour anything that man puts out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to, to quote our good friend Dirk Manning, the author, the comic book author Dirk Manning, every time he sees something that he likes on social media, like this, for example, this would be a perfect example of it. He always says, my body is ready for this. <laughs> yeah, have you ever seen him say that? I love yeah. it. <laughs> so yeah. that's, uh, that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's we're great. ready. It's great to have a filmmaker like, like Cosmatos who you can get in on the ground floor like, you know, it's, it's also fun, super fun to discover stuff that from somebody who's been doing it for years or decades and you can catch up with all their stuff. But when it's somebody who's like of the, of the moment, who's just getting started, hopefully has a long career ahead of them. You can just grab onto it and go like, okay, what's this guy going to do next? It, you know, it's the same thing with Ari Aster who did uh, Hereditary and, and Midsummer? you know, he's just getting started with this stuff and anything he does, I want to see it. And he's, he's working on something new too. That's supposed to be like so scary. It's unwatchable, which is like already <laughs> what he's done, you know? So right. um, those kind of directors, it's great to be, uh, to get in on the ground floor with them. So yeah. can't wait for, yeah. for Mato. Oh yeah. Something else fun that I remember. Um, I think we've all seen this, um, many months or years ago but uh what was that what's that one store in california that does what's in my bag and they'll they'll find you know amoeba. people in, amoeba yeah amoeba records. there's an amoeba records episode that uh panos is on and and it shows what he bought so in the comments oh yeah i think I we're gonna it. we're gonna link that so you guys can check that out because uh, i don't remember what he bought now but we'll be able to review that in a minute and uh and check that out that's very fun and uh, you know also Thank goodness for companies like uh, XYZ Films, too, out of, I think they're out of New Zealand. Um, they've been putting out a lot of cool stuff over the years now. So it's great that, you know, these adventurous film companies that are trying to make, you know, more true and gritty and, um, you know, not blockbuster stuff um, are connecting with great writers and directors like uh, Megan and Panos to create these films that I know we're gonna, just going to love forever. It's going to be great looking forward to it speaking of blockbusters that's right we're gonna close out this episode of v3 cast with a little fun uh question that i always like to ask you guys uh, and i always make it a low number so it's almost impossible to choose because like i mean what are we talking 30 plus years of the blockbuster right i think jaws started the blockbuster as they say right typically 40 45 years yeah there you go right so my question to you guys is from let's say jaws on um so was that 77 right is that when, when jaws came 75. on I think? 75 75 to present day give me your three favorite summer blockbuster films who's going first yeah um okay i'm gonna let me see um roll it roll aaron it. Three. aaron pick a number between one and twelve eight you're first all right. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll go. That's made up. You should have rolled a dice or something. You know, like, I don't know. I'll go um, 
N- next uh, podcast, we'll have the dice cam going. We're going to up our production value here. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to go in your chance. chronological order. Uh, it's no big surprise that they're all from the 80s because that's just it's just our <laughs> wheelhouse. So We're going to uh, be in real trouble here, I think, because we're all going to pick the same three movies. I'm going to tr- I hope we're not. I'm going to try. I don't not think we this. are. I, I tried to. All right. Not all right. Typical. Let's see how this goes. They, you know, for the audience at home, we have not discussed what our picks are <laughs> before <laughs> this began. Even I might pick one of the same movies, but we'll see. We'll see. So, OK. Uh, July of 86, Aliens. Um, that was a movie that um, I saw with Steve and, uh, and his dad, my Uncle Charlie. And uh, we were down in Dayton, Ohio. And it was just, you know, middle of summer. And at that moment, it became my favorite movie, you know, because yeah. it was it hit so hard. I hadn't even seen Alien. Um, I, I don't know if I even knew about it. You know, I was a, I was a kid, so... I don't know how much I knew about the first one, if I knew, knew anything, and maybe I had to be filled in afterwards. But I saw Aliens, and um, I wasn't prepared for how you know how heavy it was going to be, and, uh, and just how cool it was going to be. That was yeah. the thing too. Be- besides, like how scary or how heavy or whatever, it was the coolest movie I think I'd ever seen because yeah. the way the Marines talked to each other, how yeah. bad they were. All their little routines, the Sar- Sergeant Apone and his interactions with him. And he's like, you know, you, would you like me to f- fetch your slippers for you? Yeah. Oh, gee, Sarge, could you? All that stuff. <laughs> um, Vasquez, how tough she was. I had a huge crush on her being like such a tough ass woman. And um, and the guns they had were killer, the guns, man. Yeah, yeah, the the the, uh, the mini guns, you know, the Vasquez and the uh, the other dude had. It, it was just amazing. It was the coolest looking movie. It was it was awesome, and um and that defined that summer for me. That Dayton trip. I don't remember anything about '86 except being in Dayton and seeing Aliens. Um, <laughs> Alien Aliens really stole the entire cast from Near Dark. <laughs> Have you ever seen oh, Near yeah. Dark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great. You know movie. how many Vasquez is in that? Uh, you know, Bill, pa- uh, Bill, Paxton, Bill Paxton, and also yeah. uh, Henrik Bishop. Yeah, the guy yeah, like Bishop is in there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they stole the whole damn cast. It's such a it's such a great movie. And um, then skip ahead to eighty eight May, but well, that's kind of summer, right? Because I think so. Through summer, uh, Willow was a huge oh, yeah. movie um, for me and for Steve again because oh, yeah. we watched that was, on cable every day. Yeah, and I during saw that, it in during the that other summer, probably, I, I probably the following summer, right? following summer yeah so it was a two summer blockbuster basically i saw it in the theater and i loved it um and uh it had star wars vibes to me back then um you know that grand adventure and uh i loved you know val kilmer was you know this sort of han solo kind of character and he was so cool um the whole yeah. movie was great and uh I, even the bad guys i loved like that might have been the first movie. Well, not the first, but it was a it was a movie where I really loved the bad guys. Obviously, everybody loves Darth Vader, but um, you know, to really like grab onto all the characters, even the most evil ones. Everybody was super cool in that movie, and um, that was the movie that when Steve and I first started playing music together, when we started our band when we were kids, Vegetarian Cannibals, um, we were feverishly recording. Like two two do two kids recording into a little Sony jam box every day. You know, this is during the summer, so every day we were in the basement recording. Very primitive uh, techniques, but uh, <laughs> but that's how you have to start. That's how you right. should start. And um, in between, <laughs> we would we would come up, you know, upstairs and watch Willow again, or watch part of Willow, and then go back to the basement and record more. And it was just Willow and recording vegetarian cannibals yeah, and fantastic. eating like, pizza eating pizza and ice cream uh, every day. For that <laughs> it's summer. so true, man. Yeah. Um, you want to know a little so, fun fact too? Yeah. Is, uh, remember, I, I think it might have been our third or fourth episode of V3 cast. It was around Christmas. So we talked about Bad Santa. The Bad Santa's like partner in crime was in Willow. Oh, yeah. Super oh, young. Yeah. 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 It was, I forgot that, that actor's name. Tony something. But he was in there. But maybe yeah. one of his earlier roles, pro- probably, I guess. Yeah, he was probably a teenager still. Right, right. Um, so then, uh, and I had another one picked, but I'm going to 
call an audible on myself and change it. Um, so this, this one is not necessarily about the quality or how great the movie is, but about the effect it had on the summer of that year. So 1989 Batman, the first Batman with Michael Keaton, um, the hype for that movie was unprecedented. It was unparalleled yeah. probably to this day. Um, there's never been a movie that took the whole world or the whole country by storm like that. I remember being a teenager and being pissed because I knew that all these people seeing Batman and talking about Batman and wearing Batman shirts and all that stuff um, had never read a comic of right. Batman or, or any comic at all. And I was so bitter about that as an adult. How dare they? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't care about that anymore. But at that time, it was the most important thing to me. You know, this like this purity of the character. Um, and, but so the way that the hype, you know, grabbed everybody, um, be, starting before the movie came out and then rolling through the summer, it was nonstop and it was everywhere. It was on every billboard. It was on every, um, you know, it, I, I, it was the first time I think I'd ever seen a billboard for a movie yeah. and, um, it was on the cover of Rolling Stone. And I didn't, you know, as a kid, I'm like, why is a movie on the cover of Rolling Stone just because it's bad? I mean, it was everywhere. Yeah. And so the, 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 the power of that movie, um, in 1989, summer of 89 was immense. And I liked the movie at the time, you know, I'm, you know, Christopher Nolan's my, my guy and Christian Bale. Um, but that movie was, you know, had such a huge impact, uh, in, in that summer. And, yeah, and that definitely. changed, changed the marketing for movies from then on out. Everybody was trying to recreate the success of Batman. Ah, it's not going to happen every time. Can't That's do it. right. That's but right. They, they nailed it. So those are my three. Nice. Greg, how about you, sir? Yeah. So just like Aaron said, everybody, everybody knows like what the big blockbuster movies are. So I'm, I'm going to kind of relate it to like personal experience. So I had my aunt who is my mom's sister, my aunt Darlene, she was really into movies and she would, she would take like my brother me and my cousin who was her son and he was um i think he's a year older than me maybe two years uh so she would pile all three of us in the car and go see every movie you know in the summertime and so what i remember and these are these are probably generic but like you want me to do them in order so the first one well jaws goes without saying i'm not even going to talk more about jaws anybody who knows me knows that jaws is number one so I'm going to talk about three other ones. Uh, 1980 Empire Strikes Back was, uh, you know, when she took us to that movie, that was like, you know, I don't even think I had seen A New Hope because that was, you know, I, I would have been too young when that came out to go to the theater and see it. So I think Empire Strikes Back was sort of my first legit movie theater experience seeing a, yeah. a blockbuster so again i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go on too long about that everybody loves that movie uh the second one was the following summer raiders of the lost ark yeah man again my aunt took us so she had a fiero which is the funniest part about this story <laughs> because she would have her driving and then my cousin my brother and i in the passenger seat of a fiero so that just goes to show you about like safety when we were kids. Right. It was kind of, you know, like it's a two seater car, yeah. you know, and my, my cousin was, you know, he was a big, big kid. And, uh, you know, so my brother and I were left, you know, just kind of like jammed up against the window, but it didn't matter because we were no, we knew we were going to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. So. That's right. So that's the second one. And then Aaron already took the wind out of my sails in 1986. That would have been, uh, aliens. Yeah. Because I don't think I incredible. saw Alien. I don't think I saw Alien in the theater either, because my parents wouldn't allow it. <clears throat> so that those are my three, actually right four. If you're being, you know, Greg, Greg right. likes well, to cheat. It's okay. Yeah, Greg has his asterisks and uh, exceptions and and <laughs> honorable mentions. Jaws, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Jaws uh, Jaws goes without saying. Ask anybody. Right. Well, That's I'll give, totally true. I'll give my uh, cheating honorable mention. Predator was the one I was going to say, and I changed it to uh, to Batman. Because Predator oh, nice. was a was a huge summer blockbuster. Oh yeah, and it, felt, it almost feels wrong to not include a Schwarzenegger movie in summer blockbuster 
uh, conversation. So, okay, right. go ahead, Steve. Um, okay, so for me, I tried to, uh, I mean, because, you know, this list could be 50 and it still wouldn't be complete, obviously. So we're just trying to pick some favorites. I get this. Yeah. Um, so Return of the Jedi, for me, when, when Empire came out, I did see it. I think I was a little too young, you know, to really, as our buddy Dirk Manning would say, my body is ready for this. But Return of the Jedi, I was ready, waiting, yeah. couldn't wait to see how this panned out. Everybody knows, you know, uh, and I was ready for every minute of it and loved it. I remember still which theater uh, I was at and all this stuff in Kalamazoo off the, off the chain. Awesome. Um, then the next one I would say for me, um, back to the future. Um, I like all three, but number one, man, is very magical, um, timeless. Um, we probably watch them, my wife and I and the kids now probably watch it four times a year. I'm not even kidding you. Three or four times a year, we, we watch all three. Um, just like also Indiana Jones, you know, all the Rays of the Lost Ark, we do the same thing. Um, then I didn't want to have them all be in the 80s. I like how you said that earlier, Aaron. Yeah. So I, I, I forced myself to break out of that because I mean, I could have listed 30, 40 from the 80s, obviously. Yeah. But um, uh, I think it was 08, uh, t- uh, 2008, The Dark Knight. Yeah. God damn, that's good. I mean, I know you know that. That's yeah. such a good film. Um, it brought so many elements together just the right way. The the best um, actor to play Batman, um, probably the, one of the best directors to direct that film, and then of course the best guy to play the Joker. I think I don't think anybody would argue that. Basically, um, fantastic, great score, Hans Zimmer, absolutely great. Um, so that's my three. I don't have any honorable mentions. Or anything. That's my three. Sure you don't. <laughs> I don't. Like I said, though, both, all three of us could list 40. And we'd be like, oh, I forgot that one. I forgot Predator. I forgot Terminator 2. Um, right, yeah. Terminator 2 was See, there's Steve's the honorable hook. mention, by the way. You see how he snuck it in there? Knock it in. He man. did it. He did I it. knew he couldn't resist. <laughs> you always blame that on me. Right. He I'm had a fourth it. one written down on his paper, on his notes. Show him your notes. I bet it says Terminator 2. <laughs> no, no. Check it out. That was huge. It was so huge. Just my three. Too. So we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, please subscribe. Please give it a like. Leave some comments. If you want, we try to answer as many as we can. You can even email us at askv3cast.com. And until next time, we'll see you. This is V3Cast signing off. One more thing, one more thing. If you feel like sending us stuff to drink, do it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we'll we'll talk about you. We'll talk about you. Yeah, send us fun stuff. (laughs) Signing off. See you guys. All right, are you guys ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Check. One, two. Check. The quick brown fox.